My name is Rory Finnan. I'm professor of Ukrainian studies at the University of Cambridge. Um, I arrived in Cambridge in 2008 to launch our Ukrainian studies program. And since then, we've trained uh, hundreds of British students at the undergraduate level, postgraduate level um, on the diverse history of Ukraine. Uh, we're very proud of that. I'm Linnea, and you're listening to the Ukraine War Brief podcast. We'll be back in 24 hours or so with the regularly scheduled brief. But in this special episode, Yulia has a conversation with Dr. Rory Finnan. They talk about Russian imperialism, the failure of the West to recognize Russia for the death cult that it is, and what we can do to prevent something like the war in Ukraine from ever happening again. Links to topics they discuss can be found in the description. I hope you find their conversation as enlightening as I did. I think that there is this large misconception that Russia is this Druzhna strana that has all of these nations living in it peacefully. And, um, you know, they're all brothers and sisters and look at all of them getting along. And I want to sort of bust that myth because obviously Russia is an empire. And in my personal opinion, the Russian empire never collapsed. It changed its name and lost some territory and then changed its name and lost some territory again. So maybe start from there and then go into Circassians and Crimean Tatars? Certainly. Russia is indeed, today's Russia, the Russian Federation, is an expansionist land empire. So all of us need to acknowledge this is a historical fact. It's a geopolitical fact. We see it in the practice of Russian politicians and armed forces, the brutality um, in particular. This is old-fashioned conquest of an empire to and on the territory of former colonies. So in the case of Russia, we need to first acknowledge an academic failure, an intellectual failure, and that is to ignore the fact that Russia uh, is an empire and has remained one. When Vladimir Putin spoke about the dissolution of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, he didn't have in mind the loss of the aspirations of world communism, for instance. He had in mind the loss of empire for those particularly in St. Petersburg and Moscow. What he was referring to is the loss of empire as a geopolitical catastrophe. And what we're seeing right now is a neo-imperialist venture of uh, horrific brutality that is actively engaged in recolonization. So recolonization first of Crimea in 2014, and then since then occupied areas of Donbass, and then those areas occupied since the full-scale invasion after February 2022. So for us in the West, we need to acknowledge this basic fact that Russia is indeed an expansionist land empire, and that it is actively engaged in recolonization right now. So uh, why are the Crimean Tatars first, if we look at them as an example, so important? Largely has to do with the centuries of the existence of the Crimean Tatar Khanate. And this is a, a history that, of course, Moscow is not interested in us focusing on at all. But the fact of the matter is, over centuries, Russia has tried to efface the Crimean Tatar presence on the peninsula. And it is now very invested in crafting Crimea as some sort of this this uh, primordial Russian land, um, and it's nothing of the sort. In fact, um, the uh, Kharkiv-based uh, poet Boris Chichibabin in the 1960s said, this is not Russia at all. Um, and one only needs to visit Crimea and spend time there walking through abandoned towns and, and, and villages, which used to have Crimean Tatar names to understand that this inheritance that is not Russian is present everywhere in Crimea. But nonetheless, Crimea has become a showcase for Russian geopolitical and cultural power. And we in the West are complicit in amplifying and promoting um, this profile. So the Crimean Tatars are a constant reminder that this profile is uh, ephemeral, it's superficial. And so there has been a consistent effort to destroy the Crimean Tatar nation. We see it right now with the uh, the brutal crackdowns and oppression of the Crimean Tatar community and particularly civil society in Crimea. It's something that I think over the last um, nine years to our shame, we've ignored. So the West 
in particular, I think, has engaged in this amnesia about Crimea, about this crimnesia, if you will. And it's high time we focus on it before it's too late, really, before we see so much of the territory of occupied Ukraine being fashioned as somehow um, anciently Russian. And we see this going on with places like Berdyansk, uh, Mariupol in particular. Um, and we have to stop this cycle. It's a, a cycle of ignorance that is perpetuating now violence. Yeah, I think there is a lot of sort of like misconception, right? When you tell people, or particularly when I start talking about Crimean Tatar history and about Russian oppression, people have no idea. People don't, people almost don't believe you because it's like the, the level of evil and the level of colonization and the level of genocide that hasn't been seen since the Holocaust, right? And that's also why people have such a hard time believing that the war in Ukraine is real, some people, because I think that the levels and the proportions and the history tied to it is just overwhelming for someone who doesn't know anything about it. But when, particularly when I talk about Crimean Tatars and when I talk about um, all of the nations, especially Cossack nations that are sort of like located in Russia on the border with Ukraine, people have a hard time believing and understanding that actually none of these, um, I guess it's easier for them to understand how non-white populations are not Russian and have been colonized, but it's hard for them to understand how the white populations are not Russians and have been colonized. And one such example, for instance, is Karelians, right? Karelians are not Russians, but they're yeah. Russians now. So I guess if you could walk us a little a little more into Russia's colonization of uh, of um, indigenous people, especially. Well, it's, it's, it's rather shocking that Russian colonialism has existed in plain sight for as long and that we you still have these conversations about it. Um, it is a basic fact, and it's a fact that has um, relied on a pattern, a pattern of behavior, of policy, and of practice. And the behavior in this pattern can be condensed into a few words, erase, displace, and replace. Meaning Russian forces over centuries have engaged in ethnic cleansing of various non-Russian indigenous populations over the course of its existence. We have to remember that Russia is the largest country on earth. If one speaks to Russians today and even asks them how many republics are in the Russian Federation, I venture to guess that they may not be able to name them, much less quantify them. And there are 21. The largest is Sakha. And for us to understand this perspective and to get the gravity of Russian colonialism in reality, one thing is to understand that Sakha the largest republic in the Russian Federation, is the size of India. So this is a massive territory, highly diverse, hundreds if not thousands of different ethnicities, different languages. Um, so Russia has uh, very successfully colonized these territories. And in the meantime, it's um, bamboozled the West on the basis of a simple fallacy, and we often refer to this as the saltwater fallacy, the fallacy that empires only really exist when there is a body of saltwater between uh, the imperial center and the periphery, between the metropole and the colony. That's not the case with Russia. It's an expansionist land empire. It is expanded in through these uh, acquisitions and conquests of different um, uh, contiguous territory, it's expanded its its reach. And it's expanded its reach into communities that we considered, let's say, light-skinned, dark-skinned, um, uh, Islamic, Orthodox, Christian, uh, you name it. So we have to understand that first, this process typically involves ethnic cleansing and genocide. To give an example, we have in the case of Crimea and the Crimean Tatars, the czar on the record in the middle of the 19th century, using the word achishenia, this cleansing, ordering the cleansing of the Crimean Tatar population from the peninsula of Crimea. It's likely the first time that any kind of world leader uses this word uh, cleansing. A typical uh, understanding of ethnic cleansing was that it emerged in the context of um, uh, actions in the Balkans in the 1990s, but actually has this very ancient vintage um, in the Russian context. So the Tsar was very invested after 1783 when Crimea is annexed in erasing the Crimean Tatar population from the peninsula. It's also the case that in our history, if we even focus on this at all, 
1783 is framed as an annexation, we ignore the four to five different attempts to invade Crimea that led to the annexation in the first place. So this pattern is important. Displace in a race, so either through expulsion to neighboring countries, in the case of the Crimean Tatars, in the case of the Circassian peoples, many fled to the Ottoman Empire, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands um, were ultimately killed by Russian forces by horrific circumstances in special settlement camps, for instance, in the case of the Crimean Tatars in the Soviet period. And then this is the important part as well. The Russian and Soviet regimes were invested in replacing those that they eliminated. And so between 1944 and 1946, for instance, in Crimea, there were about 64,000 um, settlers from other oblasts of so the Soviet Russian Republic and the Soviet Union more broadly that went in to replace the Crimean Tatars who were deported in 1944. So today, when one speaks about the, the community, the populace of Crimea and references all these Russians, the Russians are there because they were settled there after the Crimean Tatars were forcibly um, displaced and eliminated. The same thing happened with Circassia. Circassia was a place that we talked about in the Western press in the 19th century with a lot of frequency. New York Times um, followed the uh, Circassian genocide, they didn't use the term, but followed the Circassian genocide very, very closely. They monitored the expulsion and the emigration of the Circassian people or the Adiga people from uh, Circassia. And we've since forgotten about it. In 2014, the Winter Olympics were held in Sochi. Rarely did we mention that Sochi was the ancient capital of Adige, of Circassia. That Sochi is actually Sasha in the Adige language. Last year in July, Senegalese president and chair of the African Union, Maki Sall, visited Vladimir Putin in Sochi. The two talked a great deal about colonialism. Uh, what they had in mind was Western colonialism, American colonialism. But Putin sat there using his term colonialism, and no one among the journalists reporting upon this visit spoke about the very fact that Russian colonialism had eliminated the indigenous people of Sochi, and that they were sitting on a place that had seen so much bloody genocide and ethnic cleansing. So this pattern of efface, displace, and replace is an important thing for us to acknowledge. And then we have to take on board the ways in which these events have bled into knowledge production, so into academic and intellectual life, which helps explain why we've ignored them for so long. So it's very interesting to me how Russian colonialism was completely overshadowed by like Western colonialism, right? And how Russia completely ignores it and how that bled into, first of all, into a lot of Russian and Eastern European studies at universities. Russia is Eastern European. Why are we giving it this imperial cushion where it's on the pedestal, kind of ruling over everybody else? But what surprises me the most is very often when I talk, for instance, with people from various African countries, they say, well, the West is bad. Western colonialism, Russia never colonized Africa. Well, first of all, this is a misconception because Russia is colonizing Africa right now, for instance, in the Central African Republic and in other places. It's just not done in the way in which people are used to. Russia is not physically taking out the population of Africa and like transporting it anywhere. No, it's just draining it of its resources to, you know, to the to the bottom of the barrel. Also, there is this misunderstanding where if Russia had never colonized Africa at the same time at which the West did, right, then Russia is not a colonial power. Well, Russia itself said we didn't have to colonize Africa because we could just go into our own backyard, and that's what they did. Absolutely. Um, they did. And when they did so, let's take the example of Crimea once more. In the 20th century, they were very direct and explicit about what they were doing. After the Crimean Tatars were expelled from their ancestral homeland, we're talking about 200,000, mostly women, children, and the elderly, expelled to uh, places in Central Asia and Siberia. Once they were gone, once the Soviet regime began to settle other Soviet citizens, Russian and Ukrainian, in fact, to Crimea, it spoke about what it was doing in a very imperialist vein using the same words every empire does. They spoke about making Crimea a new Crimea with its own Russian form, quote unquote. So 
when they have expanded, um, Russian forces have been very clear in documentation about what they were doing. I spoke earlier about the Tsar even using the term cleansing of an ethnic population from a territory. So this notion that somehow Russia is not an empire is is, is really absurd. It's um, staring us in the face and has been staring us in the face for a very, very long time. Um, and actually, if we take on board this question of uh, Russian colonialism in Western academic life, if we really, from a constructive perspective, consider the failure to study it, then we actually have in front of us a, a really important future in which we're studying colonialism and imperialism in, in much more vibrant and I think realistic ways that we're not just falling for this saltwater fallacy, the sense that an empire only has an imperial profile if it's colonizing distant lands that are reached you by ships. That is, the, the European colonizer gets off a ship, whereas in history, Russian colonizers have dismounted horses, or in this case, uh, dismounted tanks, um, particularly in the 20th and 21st centuries. But the actual embrace of all empires would, I think, inject a great deal of vibrancy into the study of empires more broadly. And so I think it's important for us to take that on board and try to learn from it a bit more. I think it's also the reason why we're failing to study Russian colonialism the way that it, that it is, is also the amount of money that Russia invests to veil its colonialism. For instance, like the amount of Russian cultural houses or the amount of faculties with sponsored professors from Russia where Moscow pays for their everything for them to like go to London, go to New York, go to California, right? So it's not even that we are sort of failing to see this colonialism, right? We are, and it's certainly on us, but it's also very much a paid mission to make it so that we don't see it. And when I say a paid mission, actually one of the things that I think no empire has ever done so brilliantly until now is the propaganda. Russia is such a big country. There are so many Russians, right? And Russia knowingly invests lots of its resources into implementing and implanting its people with their knowledge and their message that they want to spread into various areas of life, such as New York Times, such as Cambridge, such as Oxford, such as Harvard, such as Yale, you look at it and there are all of these decorated Russian professors teaching Russian literature and Russian this and Russian that. And it's all taught from the perspective of how Russia wants us to know their history. I like to think Cambridge is an outlier, of course, but I think historically it wasn't. But I, I know that, uh, you know, we have taken very, very seriously Ukraine as an object of knowledge as a way of us reassessing Russia, too. Although, you know, there are only a few of us focused on Ukraine and Cambridge and many others who are not. But I think um, the point is a really good one. And that leads us to a number of things about Russia vis-a-vis -vis Ukrainians, Crimean Tatars, Circassian, Adige. Uh, Sakha, etc., is for us to take on board a number of things that have contributed to our failure of understanding Russian colonialism. One of them is simple intellectual laziness. So going back to this point before about the largest republic within the Russian Federation being the size of India, if one finds, let's say, a scholar working on Yakutia, Sakha, in the West, um, I'd be really very encouraged to see their scholarship. But the fact of the matter is, we focus on St. Petersburg and Moscow, we focus on um, elements of Russian culture that resemble our own. So we look desperately for uh, texts of Russian liberal writers, we look at dissidents in Sami's Dot, we find the things that relate to our own perspective and that ultimately is a good intention, but intellectually it's highly problematic because what we're missing is, of course, a history of brutal Russian imperial chauvinism, which is the kind of thing that is powering um, this invasion. It's not simply Putin's war. We can see it coursing through Russian society across generations, across different parts and, and regions of the country. So there is this intellectual laziness that has, I think, led us to just focus on this small part of Russia at the expense of the wider whole. The other thing is what we might call colonizer solidarity. And this is something we've got to confront. In most Western academic institutions, if one does find 
faculties or schools that focus on culture and language. And of course, these are, are, are slowly receding, and this is a huge institutional and intellectual problem. But if we do look to those places, what we're going to find is, of course, departments of French, uh, German, Italian, etc. What we do is we focus on the high culture, quote unquote, of former imperial powers. So in this sense, um, when we study Russia, um, we are studying a perceived culture that resembles our own in terms of status and so-called high culture. And we ignore the achievements and aspirations of so-called smaller nations, quote unquote, or as, as Hegel and Engels referred to them in, at different times, so-called non-historical nations. So that is something as well that I think is closely related to this intellectual laziness, but is also something that's a bit more pernicious and sinister. This notion that certain places matter more than others, and we in former imperial or currently imperial places um, identify a little bit more with cultures that have that imperial past, so-called great culture, without questioning really what makes them great or why we even use the term great to begin with. I mean, really, what does that mean? That's actually interesting. I have um, an article on Medium. I tried my hand at writing. I am one of those people that like needs to sit there and really think about how to write things, uh, especially because English is my second language. Sometimes I think writing is where you really can tell I'm an immigrant, <laughs> <laughs> or at least my process of writing. You're like, oh, okay, she's not American. But um, I wrote this piece and the piece was titled something along the lines of like, why does the West fall so easily for Russian propaganda? It's because the West decided today that Russia is bad and they're getting like acquainted with bad Russia through what Russia is doing to Ukraine in 2022. They're not getting acquainted with bad Russia through Georgia in 2008. They're not getting acquainted with bad Russia through Chechnya. They're not getting acquainted with bad Russia through Russian empire, through the erasure of records, through the erasure of history, through the erasure of Ukrainian past with Kyiv and Rus, through taking over of that history. So it's like everybody has this hard time believing that like, you know, one nation could have fooled everybody with all of these. With They're a paper tiger. They stole, you know, their neighbor's history. They stole their neighbor's resources and they directed them into Moscow and St. Petersburg which is largely why anytime there are movies about Russia, you know, we don't see any other cities. It's always Moscow or St. Petersburg. While even if you think about the United States, we tend to overlook our smaller towns too. But, you know, we still have lots of other cities to talk about. And so does the UK, you know. But when it comes to Russia, it's Moscow and St. Petersburg. And so people have this like super hard time believing that all of this evil could have been happening, that, you know, Russia could have been this failed state that has no intellectuals at this point, right? Because all of their intellectuals for the past like 200 years have been fed a scenario, not a pool of knowledge, right? That Russia doesn't have an army, that Russia doesn't have all of these, you know, resources, that Russia doesn't have all of these achievements. They have been stolen through the Soviet Union and through the Russian empire from other nations. And so that's why it's so hard for your average Western folk to sort of sit there and be like, oh, wow, yes, Russia is really bad. Russia has done all this stuff because they're just now getting introduced to, well, Russia wasn't that bad. And then something happened and they decided to invade Ukraine. Nothing happened and they decided to invade Ukraine. It's a, it, They've just been continuing. I watched a Ted Bundy documentary yesterday and it gave me this um, sort of comparison in my head. It's like, Russia is almost like a serial killer, right? When you lock them up and they haven't been doing their thing for a while, and then you release them, kind of like Ted Bundy in Florida and Tallahassee, if you know that story, he was just looking for something to do, right? So it's kind of like that with Russia, where they've been getting away and getting away and getting away with colonizing nations throughout their entire history. And then Putin, the reason why he sort of screwed up so much right is because he didn't plan for it he it's like you want you you want to colonize you want the territory you want to take it over you're so upset that there is someone that would question your authority right next to your border and kind of be successful over it so i feel like one of the reasons also why this went so wrong is because it wasn't nearly as planned as it was beforehand that's a really interesting analogy i think i often think about the experiences of many Russians today that can't face the horrific genocidal nature of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Russia's attempt to subjugate Ukraine, as the experience of someone who discovers that a family member is a murderer or 
a serial killer, that, that sense of denial where you look for anything that tells you something else. Um, that's a huge psychological obstacle that we're going to have to confront and we are confronting now. But when it comes to understanding Russian history, again, I feel that this intellectual laziness has been a persistent problem. I mean, when we talk about Russia being the largest country on earth, it, there's not even a contest. It's it's nearly double the size of Canada. Human beings are diverse, complex. And if one were to really study Russia and take on board all this ethnic, linguistic, confessional, cultural complexity, um, you would have entire universities devoted to understanding it. But again, we've focused on a very, very narrow stream of cultural production. And at the same time, we've reduced Russia, and I think patronized, frankly, Russians through this notion of, you know, a, a society that is um, constantly in need of a strongman autocrat, rather than taking them more seriously and, and seeing that they have agency. And that agency is in many respects driven by imperial desires. And if one looks at polling over the past couple of months of Russian respondents, an open survey, of what they think they have gained through the so-called special military operation. The biggest response, the one that gets the most support, is acquisition of new territories, which tells you a lot about Russian society seeing itself as having an identity that is acquisitive, that is, that is greedy, that is about nothing more than spreading. And this is why when one looks at Russian history, what you see is constantly a history of intellectuals that are in search of an identity. And the only thing that they can really agree upon is the so-called velich, the greatness, the greatness of the Russian state in particular. But the principles behind that state are nowhere to be found. They're simply that they spread. So if one looks at American imperialism, and there is indeed such a thing, there are always principles about liberty and democracy that are enshrined in our constitution that balance out often these imperial desires in the American context. There isn't anything comparable in the Russian one. If we look at Ukraine, there's a lot that Americans and particularly uh, Europeans should see that's familiar. A concern with volia, a volia that is not about, you know, a free rampant liberty of the steppe, but about a anti-colonial liberty that should be available to everyone, which is why, for instance, when we think about Ukrainian literature, and we think about the Circassian genocide, I think often Ukrainians themselves forget that when they're saying the words, they're actually speaking words that Shevchenko, the great Ukrainian poet of the 19th century, intends for the Circassian mountaineers resisting Russian conquest. So those are lines that he is, he is telling to those fighting Russian conquest in the middle of the 19th century. So as much as we forget the Circassian genocide, for instance, in the West, Ukrainians implicitly remember it when they recite poems like Shevchenko's Kafkaz, which are all about that anti-colonial struggle against Russian soldiers um, and, and Russian uh, imperial conquest. So there's a lot of this culture that we can excavate. There's a lot of this history that's staring us in the face. The question is right now whether we have the courage and the energy to confront it and dive into it and also accept mistakes and, and, and realize our failures. And that's something that I think in Slavic studies is slowly taking place. But I do worry that we're slipping back into this new normal that reminds me of the initial reaction after the annexation operation of Crimea in 2014, when there was an initial shock for a few months. And then everyone settled back into this notion that Crimea was somehow Russian. And um, we've let over the past nine years the peninsula become militarized. And we've also seen a militarization of consciousness that is extremely problematic and requires a lot of intellectual labor to overcome. If you're enjoying the episode, please rate us and leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us via email at social at borlingen.media. That's B-O-R-L-I-N-G-O-N dot media. If um, Holodomor is studied on the same level as the Holocaust is, and I'm not by any means comparing the two events. Sure. Here's the thing. Almost every country has a Holocaust Remembrance Day. Almost 
every country well, or every country with like a decent education system, the first thing that you learn about World War II is the Holocaust, right? No one talks about Holodomor. This is not for comparison's sake, but the Holocaust is about 11 million people who died. Holodomor is from anywhere from 4 million to 11 million people, depending on whether you just count deaths from, you know, from starvation or not. And that is the first sort of genocide, right, that everybody overlooks. And I don't think, because we think Germany bad, and we West bad, and we show Holocaust, and we show World War II, and we show Russia as this, like, sort of savior, right? But the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and Russia helping Germany and Russia dividing Europe with Germany and the fact that the only reason Russia ended up going against Germany is because Germany at some point got too greedy and was like, oh, we don't need you anymore. And the fact that we're not studying Holodomor and the fact that we're not uh, condemning Russia for World War II, I think is also one of the main driving factors of why we forget about these things so fast. Because if we had had not specifically devoted studies, right, but in the regular program, in your normal high school program of history, if along with World War II, we also studied Holodomor, I think it'd be harder to forget what kind of a genocidal maniac Russia is. And people would have this notion in their head that they weren't always this mystical, imperial kind of interesting place where great poets and ballet live. Because a lot of those great poets are actually Ukrainian and Kazakh and Belarusian and, you know, and uh, Yakutian and Dagestani, but they're forced to say they're Russian. Otherwise, they're never going to make anything of themselves. And the interesting thing for me, which might be interesting to you as a historian, is this uh, sort of confusion over Bandera and what Bandera is and like plain historical facts versus how people perceive him, right? It's sort of not the Nazism that plays part here. It's the liberation. And it's most people don't actually follow his, you know, follow his footsteps or follow his, you know, ideology or anything. It's just most people see him as like the beacon of liberation, especially in Western Ukraine. Yeah, but Bandera is complicated because, as you say, you know, um, if one reads his writing, for instance, and follows his pronouncements, he's problematic in the extreme. Mm -hmm. um, if we're just looking at this, let's say, clinically, right? If we're just kind of stepping back and saying, okay, who is Stepan Bandera? What did he say? I mean, well, he's largely anti pole right? So there's a great deal of animus toward Poles. And he is very much interested in instantiating and establishing within Ukraine this very kind of in the, in the history of Ukrainian intellectual thought, a very un-Ukrainian kind of authoritarian type regime, which was in fashion at the time, right? Yeah. Um, but you're right that he stands for someone who took up arms to liberate Ukraine against two different imperial powers. So therefore, you know, at this emotional level, he's a model and he's also a model that, that the Kremlin has made into a boogeyman. So that then creates this impetus among a lot of Ukrainians to reach for him even more. But yeah, he's he's hugely problematic. Um, and, and, and the thing is about Ukrainian heroes is that there are no shortage of them. I mean, in history, there are so many who are committed to liberation, so many who sacrifice, fight, stand up for these, these various, really, I think, outstanding principles that are the center of Ukrainian thought, the main direction of travel for thinking about, you know, what is the Ukrainian political idea? Yeah, it's very much one of anti-colonial democracy, and one that is based on a kind of decentralized form of government, not one that's about a you know a charismatic strongman, which Dmitry Donsov and Bandera were kind of interested in. So that's what makes Bandera you know such a, a complex and, and problematic figure, and someone who then gets kind of tossed around as discursive propagandistic football. And going back to what you mentioned earlier about Holodomor, if you look at how the Kremlin creates this boogeyman of the Benderite as some sort of hyper ultra nationalistic figure. You also have prior to that in 1932-33, the Politburo referring to Ukrainian saboteurs of grain requisitions as Petlurites. So Petlura became the boogeyman. Initially, over time, they needed a newer figure. Bandera fit the bill and has stayed with us ever since. Well, it's also interesting because, you know, uh, for Ukrainians, right, like Bandera is a very problematic figure. But again, he's a very complicated figure. And I think when you look at his actions and at him, I think with a lot of commitment and a lot of responsibility say that our Hitler was Stalin, 
so by the time that World War II started and Hitler was kind of coming into Ukraine, we were just sort of like, well, that's not the biggest of our issues right now because we've already had that. And if you look at Bandera through the backdrop of like Holodomor and through the backdrop of Polish invasion, right? Like I believe that Ukraine owes Poland lots of apologies for what we have done. But I also think that there is this misconception with Poland where it was this Polish land. And then there is Bandera who just sort of came up and started murdering Poles. But that's not how Ukrainians felt. It's like it's not your land if you face resistance when you go there. And you faced a lot of resistance from Ukrainians who did not want to be colonized by Poland at the time. So I think if you look at it through the backdrop of just this one Western part of Ukraine that's facing Russia, facing Poland, facing all of these things, it kind of makes sense that there would be this super ultra radical guy who is just like, no, uh, we're going to do something about it. But also there is this kind of uh, twisting of history where he was, uh, where people say that like, oh, Bandera killed this and Bandera killed that. Bandera wasn't a concentration camp at the time. So there is also a lot of like misinterpretation of history that makes him sound sort of like much worse than what he actually was. Yes, he was an extremist. Yes, he's not someone whose notions should be followed. But in reality, if we look at his track record alone, he personally didn't do most of the stuff that's attributed to him. It's sort of like the people who embarked onto his ideology and interpreted it in the way that was that worked for them at the time. You know, if we think about it from the perspective of um, historical memory, and if we think about the various propagandistic political projects that the Kremlin engages in with, with respect to Ukraine, and particularly the, the Second World War, there's so much focus on Bandera, but not at all a focus on Vlasov, for instance. Thousands of soldiers that are actually allied with the Wehrmacht and the Nazi um, forces in the Second World War and collaborated very openly with them. So anytime we see such a focus on one figure that then is reduced to a couple of ideas and is basically, again, framed as a boogeyman, we should always be suspicious. Um, and there are plenty of, of Russian collaborators in the Second World War. Um, and of course, there is the collaboration, as you mentioned before, between 1939 and 1941, under the auspices of the Molotov-Rippentrop Pact and the secret protocols, which divided Poland, for instance, and which saw actually so much learning between uh, the SS, the Russian and Soviet secret services. They shared lessons with each other about how to dominate and subjugate their own citizens, as well as those that they conquered. So the biggest collaborator with Nazi forces were, of course, Stalin and his his ilk before Operation Barbarossa, when, of course, they were subject to invasion and then uh, abandoned Ukraine, of course. That's a very important remembrance that, of course, Ukraine suffered under both Stalin and Hitler, as did Belarus and other parts of the Soviet Union. But the, the, the Red Army uh, was so incompetent and Stalin so ill-prepared that they abandoned and destroyed so much of Ukraine's infrastructure. So the same things that we're seeing now with bridges, dams being destroyed, um, the Soviets uh, did that to themselves in Ukraine and left Ukrainian civilians at the mercy of invading Nazi forces. Uh, and that's also uh, a history that, of course, uh, Russians have long sought to forget. I guess one of the very simple examples would be the destruction of Zaporizhia Dam. Mm -hmm where hundreds of thousands of people suffered the consequences of that and died. And um, it was done to stop the Nazis, yet it didn't even slow them down and there were better yeah. ways of doing it. But it was also just a very convenient way to wipe out some of the Ukrainians. When we study World War II, we study it very wrong in most of the Western countries because we only study it through the lens of Germany bad. And when we think of like the destruction of Ukraine or Belarus or anything that was on the way for the Nazis to Russia, we just completely skip through that. And then we we're like, oh, the battles in Russia were horrendous. Well, yes, they were, but they also leveled a country before they even got to Russia. So to me, it's it's very interesting how the studies of the history of World War II are so incredibly skewed and so incredibly uncomprehensive that kids at school have sort of no way of studying Russia as what it was in World War II, which was the villain too. The villain that then decided to change its course because the other villain dropped it and kind of came out on top, right? I think that we in the Western world kind of, and it's our own 
fault too, but we don't even have a chance to imagine that we need to study Russian history deeper and that Russia could be this colonial power because when we talk about these major events in history, we just kind of skip Russia as anyone who was involved in the same or comparable sort of evil as Germany was. And I think another interesting thing is that we take Germany as this pinnacle of evil in World War II. But Germany had this policy and this politics and this leader for a couple of decades, right? So it affected a couple of generations. Russia has had the, these kinds of leaders, like comparable to Hitler on so many different levels, right? Through centuries. And they've never gone away. They've never had a democratic leader. They've always had a Tsar, whether it be like a royal family blood Tsar or whether it be Lenin or Stalin or Putin for that matter, right? And they've always had this policy of genocide and always had this policy of we are, you know, at the top of the world, sort of like Russia über alles. And we just don't pay attention to it because our pinnacle of bad and genocide is Germany. While German history of that is this compared to Russia's history of that. There is um, so much complexity in, first of all, Russian history and Soviet history, and then the history of various atrocities committed by Russian and Soviet agents, forces in Europe is, uh, is vast. And in the collective Western consciousness, understandably due to the kind of singular horror of the Holocaust, the Nazi villain has taken a lot of oxygen out of the room and it has allowed us to forget um, and to overlook you know, so much of these Russian and Soviet villains. And then there's, of course, the problem of just conflating Soviet Union with Russia to begin with. If one listens to, you know, Stalin's radio address after Hitler invades in 1941, you, you hear Stalin, first of all, panicked, but secondly, calling on all the different nations, Ukrainians, Georgians, Belarusians, Latvians, etc., to rise up against Nazi invaders. So whenever it suited him, Stalin would resort to cultivating national identities. And that complexity comes to the fore, that diversity of, for instance, the Soviet Red Army. And when one looks at understanding now in Western Europe about um, the Second World War, and particularly the Soviet contributions to its escalation, right? I mean, Molotov Ribbentrop gave Hitler a lot of space to armed forces and gave them a lot of room uh, and legitimacy to expand and begin the Holocaust to begin with. There is, yeah, a great deal of reckoning still to do. Uh, and it comes down to things like terms. We have to go back to the basics and the fundamentals constantly to understand uh, this complexity in its fullest sense. And we've got a lot of work to do, Yulia. I think, you know, the... There's a great deal with respect to the Second World War that we need to confront, and obviously throughout the Soviet period, a great deal, and obviously right now with um, respect to recolonization that we started our conversation with. For sure. And there is also, I think, aspect of Crimean Tatar colonization that um, we sort of didn't cover is like we normally talk about the very avid colonization of Crimea, which happened in 2014, but we never really talk about how Crimea was avidly being colonized pre-2014 as well. It just wasn't out in the broad light. It's the Russian Black Sea Fleet, right? It's the, the giving out of the Russian passports on the street, like, so to speak, right? It was um, Russian literature, Russian cultural festivals. So all of this was already happening. This colonization was kind of seeping in be way before 2014. And in 2014, it just kind of like, it had the ability for like the button to, okay, be pressed and now be done in the broad daylight, right? Because there is now no Ukraine monitoring over it. In late 2013, there was a very large study done. About 1,200 respondents from Crimea asked a host of questions. Among them, do you think Crimea should be a part of Ukraine? And the vast majority of respondents said yes. There's great work done by Eleanor Knott in a recent book in which she did a great deal of close one-on-one -on -one interviews. And even those who are the most avidly, quote unquote, pro-Russian, I actually hate these terms because they, they conceal more than they reveal. But her interviews made very clear that most everyone, despite their pro-Russian sentiments, um, and there were just a minority at the time, even they 
we're not interested in leaving Ukraine. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. So th this goes back to our, our broader problem of recognizing Russian colonialism in the first place. Because if you don't recognize Russia as an empire, which it is, if you don't recognize Russian colonialism and its history, which has been present and staring us in the face for so long, you can't actually exact proper policy to serve your citizens. So if you don't acknowledge, first of all, that Crimea, like many other places in Ukraine, needed to actively undergo processes of decolonization. So the artifice, the structure of empire has to be dismantled culturally, politically, and, uh, and socially. If you don't even acknowledge that it's existing, this colonialism, it's very hard to decolonize. And if we look at Western scholarship about Crimea between 1991 and 2013, 14, the predominant paradigm is not at all one that mentions colonialism. It just mentions that there's this kind of triadic relationship between Crimean Tatars, Russians, and Ukrainians. And there's a kind of balancing act going on, but there's nothing about these um, hidden colonial legacies, the production of post-colonial culture, nothing really in that scholarship. And so that then led us to fail in so many ways. One of them is we never said there should be reparations to the Crimean Tatars. We never talked about truth and reconciliation commissions. We never proposed electoral quotas. All of these have been used in cases where settler colonialism on a territory has been a factor in a territory or a country's history. And if we don't even acknowledge the problem of colonialism, we can't then learn from these other cases of settler colonialism and then help territories like Crimea, which then led to an annexation operation in 2014, and particularly, I think, led to the West shrugging its shoulders ultimately um, over that very grave um, and very consequential act that we should have responded to with with much more purpose and um, and much more, I think, aggressive sanctions policy. And it, it's a it's a problem that persists today with this rather piecemeal incremental provision of arms and support for Ukraine. We need to acknowledge this imperial reality and also confront right now how this imperial past is metastasizing into a presence of, of real fascist violence that is becoming day to day very normalized in Russian society. So with each day that we stall in confronting this reality and then supporting Ukraine with arms, the more Russian society becomes accustomed to atrocity after atrocity. Uh, and that's a very dangerous prospect for the future. Do you think that maybe one of the issues was um, that in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the way that sort of we study Russia, right? I think that the West had this idea of, oh, we won because they thought that communism was the issue. And therefore, the way that the West addressed sort of the next steps with Russia was over the thing of like, oh, well, OK, like we're, you know, we've done what we need to do. But the larger issue was not communism. The larger issue was imperialism and colonialism. And I think that the way that we addressed it and the way that we sort of went about studying all of it was from the perspective of like, ah, we did our job. Yeah, I think there's been so much intellectual laziness with respect to the study of the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire before it. Um, this lack of attention to the complexity of these different ethnic groups that had been conquered. Because of that, we tended to read, uh, again, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but the predominant reading was always ideological. Um, it was more annoying in the context of Sovietology. If one looks at the conventional scholarship, it was more annoying to study Belarusians and Ukrainians, um, Georgians, um, Armenians. One needed to focus on Moscow and Petersburg. That was the, that was the predominant way in which the Soviet Union was, was studied and understood. And so naturally, when the Soviet Union dissolves, there is a sense in the West that the issue had been addressed, that it's been primarily ideological, that actually in a uh, global capitalist system based on exchanges of trade, that we'll all have vested interests in our common wealth and uh, rising tide lifts all boats, all these rather um, quaint notions, particularly where we sit now in 2023. Um, they did predominate in 1991, and there was a lack of reckoning with this colonial past, and it is now something that has caused the greatest geopolitical conflict and crisis that we've faced in generations. It's high time we see it clearly. 
Um, it's complex, so it takes a lot of work and a lot of intellectual labor to parse things out. And there are no simple solutions. But if we can't acknowledge uh, this empire and this colonialism right now, then uh, we're only setting ourselves up for more escalations, more violence and war uh, going forward. So the best thing all viewers and readers can do at this moment is acknowledge the reality of Russian colonialism, and then at the same time, listen very closely to those voices of the colonized, and listen carefully to what they say about what the empire intends and what it's prepared to do. You answered my my last question is, how do you think we can avoid this happening in the future? on the level of like education and on the level of just not even like higher education, but on the level of just day-to-day -day education. Because as I mentioned earlier, you don't have to be a high intellectual to know what Holocaust is and what Germany did, right? But you unfortunately today have to be in higher education or a historian to know what Holodomor is and what Russia did, or at least up until early 2022, you had to be a scholar and you had to be a scientist to know these things, right? Which is just mind blowing. It's mind blowing, but also that those scientists and those scholars also fell victim to these common reductions, right? Also fell victim to this conflation between the Soviet Union and Russia. Uh, that's a conflation that completely pulls out of view the contributions, the actions, the agencies of so many different kinds of people in the, in the Soviet Union. Uh, when one looks at the Russian Federation today, again, we're talking about 21 different republics, the largest of which is the size of India. We're not studying that Russia. We're studying a small place of Moscow and Petersburg, and we are elevating for our attention the so-called high culture when there is so much more that we need to attend to. And what we find is disturbing. What we find is actually horrific, this imperial chauvinism that is getting legitimated and comfortable day in and day out. So the best thing we can do is invest our attention in amplifying Ukrainian voices, Georgian voices, Belarusian voices, um, Kazakh voices, Kurumli, Crimean Tatar voices, um, and then also just basically acknowledging this intellectual failure. There's nothing more disappointing than seeing someone like Barack Obama in an interview with Christian Amanpour not take stock of 2014 and understanding that the reactions to the Crimean annexation were mealy-mouthed and um, ineffective. Um, one can understand from his perspective this need to bring down the temperature. And, and I, I even at the time remember thinking, okay, I disagree with this approach, but I can understand where one is coming from. Fast forward nine years, you want people to assess it um, once more and say, we made a wrong call. And um, without acknowledging those failures, then we can't be successful in the future in bringing peace to, to Europe and the world. All we'll see is a perpetuation of the same mistakes and then an escalation of more violence. Um, so in short, we need to arm Ukraine. We need to do everything we can to support Ukrainians, amplify voices, and realize that this common Western refrain of, you know, we'll support Ukraine as long as it takes, there's amazing resilience, all that's true. Um, but that is, I think, irresponsible in the extreme because it, it's premised on the notion that somehow we're doing something for Ukraine when in the reality, Ukraine is doing something for all of us. We have so much invested in our success in common with Ukraine. These are things we need to do at universities and think tanks, obviously in, in corridors of power and various world capitals. It's going to take a lot, um, but that first recognition of Russia as an expansionist land empire with a history of colonialism that has caused colonized peoples as well to suffer sometimes from a lack of self-esteem for their own culture. Anthropologists often call this invidious comparison, where colonized people absorb and digest this sense that they are less than the culture or the position of the profile of the colonizer. And that takes time to work through. And so we need to see and understand that these identity projects require our support and understanding and sensitivity too. That's the brief for today. Remember to check your sources and don't fall for propaganda. Join us on YouTube and TikTok for more Ukraine content and live news reports. And please consider supporting our work on Substack. 
You'll find the links in the description. We'll be back again tomorrow with regular updates. Until then, stay safe, everyone. Do popanchinya.